Hello, my name is Weston Kanishi. I'm president of the Sake Brewers Association of North America. We're the trade association promoting and advocating for the growing sake industry in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Um, to learn more about us, please visit our website at www.sakeassociation.org. Uh, tonight, we're really excited to launch the second in our three-part sake webinar series that we're doing in partnership with the Embassy of Japan in the United States. Um, we're also, um, so our first webinar was last week. Uh, it was a fantastic dialogue between six Japanese and American brewers. Uh, if you happen to miss that, um, it is posted on our website. So I'd encourage you to, to visit it, to, to see it. Um, it's really, really good conversation. And we're very excited about tonight's uh, session, which is going to be um, looking at the regulatory environment affecting the sake industry and a discussion about the future growth of sake in the North American market. Um, so before we get started, I just want to uh, thank our partners, again, the, the Embassy of Japan in the United States. I also want to thank uh, Japan House of Los Angeles and the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C. for helping to get the word out about uh, our webinar events. So many thanks to, to our partners with that. Uh, a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Also, um, this session will be recorded. Um, so uh, please check out our website in a couple of days uh, to, to view it again if you want. And we will have a Q&A session toward the end of tonight's webinar. Uh, please, if you want to post a question, press the Q&A button at the bottom right hand side of your screen. Nihongo demo daijoubu desu. Um, finally, we have a, a survey. Uh, we'd love to get your feedback on what you thought of tonight's event. So please just take a minute at the end to um, uh, answer our, our survey. So with that, um, I'm very pleased to introduce Bernie Baskin. He's the founding president of the Socket Brewers Association. Uh, and he's going to present tonight on his comprehensive survey uh, on the um, on the regulatory landscape affecting the sake industry in North America. It's an enormous body of work. It's, it's really impressive. Uh, and we're all very proud of Bernie for, for um, all of his hard work on this. And we're so, so excited that he's finally getting a chance um, <laughs> to present it to, uh, to our viewership tonight. And so I'm just so thrilled uh, to introduce Bernie and to um, start the, the rest of this session. So with that, Bernie. Hey, thanks, Wes. I really appreciate that. And uh, I can't take all the credit. I'll tell you the story of this, uh, this publication here in just a little bit. Um, but I am, um, I'm truly delighted to be here. Uh, before I get started, I just want to mention that we do have translators this evening. We are um, really, 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 really blessed to have translators this evening. I want to introduce uh, Chiori Okazaki-san who will tell you a little bit about that. But uh, here in just a minute, you're gonna see an interpretation globe at the bottom right-hand side of your Zoom. Uh, if you'd like to listen in English, uh, select English. If you'd like to listen in Japanese, uh, please select Japanese. And Chiori, let me just pass the baton over to you to just tell uh, our, our Japanese viewers about this feature. こんにちは、え、通訳の岡崎と申します。よろしくお願いいたします。え、今日は私とえ、マーブルグリサさんとで通訳をしておりますけれども、Thank you, Shiori san. Um, I'm going to turn on the interpretation feature now. And you should be able to see it. So, with that, um, Wes, again, thank you so much for having me and uh, my colleagues and friends on tonight. I am truly delighted to be here. Uh, as Wes mentioned, I'm the, the former president, a current board member here at the Sake Brewers Association of North America. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story now about uh, 2019. So in early 2019, I, um, 
I spent an outstanding weekend uh, with Andrew Santafonte, who's on the call, and I'll introduce the rest of the panelists here in just a, just a second, but before we do that, just a little bit of a story. Um, so I spent an outstanding weekend with Andrew Santafonte, the owner of Charlottesville, Virginia's North American Sake Brewery. Uh, and there's a long meandering story about how that weekend came to be in the first place, uh, but we hadn't met. And at the time, the Sake Brewers Association of North America did not exist. And frankly, it hadn't really been conceived. So over the course of the weekend, as I got to know Andrew, we spoke about nearly every topic that I can think of related to sake. I helped him make koji. We tasted his product. We spoke about the industry as a whole, which new breweries were popping up across North America, uh, the challenges in the industry. I tried identifying the missing pieces that cr create real change for sake outside of Japan. Uh, it was a restless weekend. Uh, <laughs> there, were, there were many moments of, uh, of drinking his sake, which is fantastic. It was full of brainstorming, full of possibility, full of sake. Uh, and I left that weekend and headed back to my home in Washington, D.C. Uh, with, a, with a new focus. And it was to help brewers form a trade association to represent the interests of sake across North America. And as the pieces for this trade association began to come together, we began looking at the underlying framework for the industry. Uh, what makes it tick? And where are the hurdles and the roadblocks? How can we create an atmosphere for positive growth? And to put this in the context of a brewery, traditional sake has only four ingredients, but anyone who's traveled through Japan, uh, through Japan's most storied breweries, knows that yeast grows in the rafters, the koji room is warm, the rest of the brewery is cold, Water is pulled from nearby rivers. There are shrines on the walls. The labels are lovingly pasted by hand. And there's a certain atmosphere that helps create the best sake. So how could we, as a new trade association, create the right atmosphere for the industry to flourish? How to help the yeast grow in the rafters, you might, you might say. So one of the first areas that we looked at uh, was the laws and regulations surrounding the industry. I don't think this had really been looked at before. Now, there are many stories about the difficulties of setting up sake breweries here in America, and I'll talk about a few of these shortly, and you'll hear more during the discussion this evening. But until 2019, no one that I know had cataloged all of the sake laws and regulations across America, both at the federal and at the state level, uh, Canada and Mexico, but we did. Um, it, it was deemed uh, important enough and, and we decided to do it. And we were fortunate to have a very, very nice relationship with uh, Washington University and St. Louis School of Law, who allowed us to work with two of their students, uh, Colin Summerlin and Valerie Jang. And Wes, those are the real hard workers on this project. They put blood, sweat and tears in on this. And uh, these two uh, students worked diligently through the summer of 2019 to build a 166 page book that provides a deep, law, a, dive, a deep dive into every sake law and regulation that touches sake across all 50 United States, the four, four provinces of Canada and parts of Mexico. Uh, as you might imagine, this is a living document. It's still very much a work in progress, but it gives us a pretty good sense for where the challenges are and where the opportunities still exist. Now, over the coming months, we'll be looking to publish this book more globally. And I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to do it in multiple languages. But I hope our Japanese colleagues on the line uh, will, will get excited for that. Um, at the, the information is already accessible for our members, uh, but to publish this more widely. We are, as Wes mentioned, extremely proud of this project. I'm personally proud of it. I'm proud of all of the hours that went into it from so many people. Uh, and we are very, very excited to share it with the rest of the world in the very near future. So I wanna turn now to focus on a few of the major challenges that, that we've identified that we think the industry currently faces as we embark on this conversation today. First, sake is not defined under US Canadian or Mexican law. Now, historically, this has not been an insurmountable challenge. We're a small, albeit growing, industry, and we know that there are many brewers across North America that are still experimenting with sake. 
However, as the industry continues to grow, it will become more important to set out some basic parameters of what sake is and perhaps what it's not. Whether the industry follows Japan exactly or uses Jap Japan's laws as a guiding star is still very much an active discussion amongst brewers, consumers, the governments of these, the governments of these countries and our trade association. But as sake attracts more consumers, it will be important for them to understand what they're drinking when they look at a label, when they look at a bottle, and to ensure a basic level of consistency amongst language in this part of the world. Second, in America, incorporating a sake brewery is not a straightforward affair. Uh, the federal government requires a certain incorporation process, and each state does as well. However, the sake industry is relatively new to this area of the world, you might imagine. And as such, the laws and regulations don't always make perfect sense. For example, at the federal level, sake is treated as a beer for matters related to production and tax. However, for label, labeling and advertising, sake is treated as a wine. And these two opposing views create some level of confusion. As anyone wishing to produce sake must qualify as a brewery, but also must file an application for a permit to produce and blend wine. In an odd twist that doesn't apply to traditional beer and wine, the application process for sake must be done via paper forms as well and submitted by mail, uh, which has caused a few issues during COVID, you might imagine. And number three, at the state level in America, the law gets slightly more confusing because each state determines how sake is classified within its borders, beer or wine or something else entirely. And this does have significant implications. In some states, like Virginia, for example, wine producers are required to have an attached restaurant to be able to let customers taste their product. And it can't be a minor food operation. To be classified as a restaurant, it must, uh, it must clear $2,000 a month in food sales, which can be a significant hurdle for small sake breweries just establishing. In Virginia, beer breweries are not subject to the same restaurant requirements, and that significantly eases the burden on startup sake breweries uh, if they were to be classified as a beer brewery. In other states where sake breweries are governed by beer laws, additional oddball regulations apply. For example, in Tennessee, sake is governed by beer laws. However, since sake generally has more than 8% ABV, Tennessee governs it according to a high gravity beer law. And under these regulations, no customer can buy more than five gallons of sake at a single visit to the brewery. That's roughly a two case cap for walk-in customers in Tennessee. Now, not that many customers are gonna walk in and say, give me three cases, but it really shouldn't be a preventative law. Uh, the determination of beer versus wine regulation also has direct implications on taxation. In some states, wine is taxed significantly higher than beer. In others, beer is much higher. In some states, for example, Arkansas, grocery stores can only sell beer, not wine. So the determin of determination of what sake is affects the ability to distribute it in certain places. Now, as far as I know, only the state of Colorado has enacted sake specific legislation, but that came about only as a result of sake breweries making their voices heard. Now, I could go on and on and on and on and on, but suffice it to say that sake laws are rather confusing because there's no definition of sake under the law. And this leads to significant challenges, but there are plenty of opportunities ahead. And the Sake Brewers Association of North America is committed to identifying these opportunities for breweries and the allied sake trade. And as we turn now to the discussion at hand, uh, a focus of the rules of the brew, I wanna welcome three of my friends and colleagues. Uh, I'll start with Jamie. Uh, Jamie Graves uh, is the Japanese portfolio manager at Skernik Wines in New York City. Uh, he's worked in sake and Japanese cuisine for 18 years. He got his start as a cook in restaurants in Japan after college, and he learned all sorts of aspects of the, uh, the cuisine and the language. In 2007, he moved to New York, where he was a manager at pioneering Japanese restaurants like Kajitsu, Brushstroke, and the sake bar Sakemai. In 2014, he was a finalist at the World Kikasakeshi Competition. Ultimate, ultimately receiving the Judge's Choice Award. 
And in 2017, he started the, Japanese, the Japan portfolio at the New York-based importer and distributor Skernik Wines and Spirits. They carry 90 different sakes from 40 kura and 15 shochu from five distilleries, as well as a large selection of Japanese spirits like gin and whiskey. Uh, Sachiko Miyagi is the sake expert at Tipsy, one of the leading e-commerce sites for sake in America. She's originally from Seattle, Washington. She worked at the C Cedar River Brewing Company, a tiny sake brewery, before moving to Los Angeles, California. She is formerly an instructor at Sake School of America, which is part of a mutual trading company. And uh, she joined top, uh, Tipsy in 2020. Uh, it's, uh, it's an e-commerce uh, platform for sake. So we'll talk a little bit more about Tipsy. Uh, and uh, my co-conspirator in the Sake Brewers Association, Andrew Santafante, he's the owner and brewer at North American Sake Brewery in Charlottesville, Virginia. He's an old friend by this point. I'm gonna have some tough questions for him. Uh, and he was instrumental as my partner during the establishment of this association. And with that, um, I just want to say again, thank you all for being here. We are truly delighted uh, to have this conversation. And Jamie, let's get started with you. If you're on mute, turn yourself off mute. And let's uh, actually, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, such good. Let's uh, let's do a compi before we get started. Uh, feel free to turn yourselves off uh, off mute. And uh, everyone, I hope you have a little bit of sake in front of you. Uh, thanks for joining us. Hope this conversation is wonderful. And compi. Compi. Bye. So Jamie, um, we've spoken a lot about some of the challenges that exist here in America and beyond uh, with the structure of the industry. And I wonder if you could just get us started here, maybe give our listeners an understanding of the three-tiered system that exists here in the United States uh, for the alcohol industry and maybe why that exists and some of the inherent differences between this system and the, and the system in Japan. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, so. I don't think it's um, anybody would be surprised uh, to know that America has a really uh, complicated relationship with alcohol. Um, when I was growing up uh, in uh, my home state of Connecticut, uh, you still couldn't buy um, alcohol on Sundays, for example. Um, and some of those laws um, still exist uh, in New York. I, I, I don't know if the law changed, but when I first moved back to New York, you couldn't buy alcohol before like something like 9 a.m. Uh, on a Sunday or something like that. Um, so there's kind of a whole, um, uh, a whole galaxy of laws, uh, the whole uh, you know, variety of different uh, things that apply, but broadly why they exist um, really stems from uh, the American period of prohibition, uh, you know, when uh, America made alcohol illegal uh, for several years. And really that changed really everything with alcohol being illegal. Um, alcohol was still coming into the US, uh, was still being made in the US, was still being sold, uh, drank, distributed. Um, but honestly, uh, to be frank, um, a, a lot of who was making that happen was uh, organized crime at the time. Uh, so when uh, they decided to uh, repeal prohibition and to uh, make alcohol legal again, um, a lot of what drove the laws and the thinking was wanting to make sure that it wasn't the same people uh, controlling uh, the entire alcohol system in the U.S. Uh, to make sure that it was kind of divided up, uh, that it wasn't um, one, you know, organization or company controlling it from top to bottom. Uh, so while the laws do differ state by state, um, pretty much every state um, by law, sort of, there are three tiers to the American system. Uh, the first is you can think of uh, the people that make alcohol. Uh, they have to be distinct uh, from the people that distribute it or sell it to other companies. So those have to be two different things. You can't be an alcohol maker and then also have sort of a distribution company that sells uh, to other companies or to other uh, wine shops, things like that. Um, and then the other part of it is as a distributor, you can't sell directly uh, to consumers. You can't sell directly to people. So that is divided up specifically. So those are the three tiers, the people that make it, uh, the companies that distribute it, uh, and then the companies that, um, you know, sell it directly to the consumer overall. Uh, so that creates some complications. And that's obviously, if you're coming from Japan, uh, that's a little bit confusing just because there aren't as many laws around al alcohol in Japan. There are plenty of laws um, in terms of distribution. It's more culture uh, around, you know, who you can sell to or how you would sell things. When I've talked to folks in Japan, uh, my understanding is as a... Um, uh, as a sake brewery, you could sell 
really to whoever you wanted to, uh, but because there are traditional uh, sort of sake shops and sake distributors, you um, wouldn't want to uh, you know, hurt feelings or, or uh, disrupt relationships. So you sort of sell to one person, but that's not really as much as I understand um, enshrined in law. That's more of a custom and sort of how the, the industry plays itself out. We're in the US, we're subject to quite a lot of laws, um, particularly uh, here in the US. Um, or not just in the US, sorry, in New York. Uh, New York State has some of the strictest laws overall. Uh, so my company, we're based in New York State. Uh, we sell in a lot of other states as well. New York, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, a lot in the East Coast, a little bit in California. Um, but our, yep, uh, but our whole, uh, um, the way my company operates, we, we always think about when we're um, uh, putting together information for products and registering things, we always go by New York because it's the strictest overall. We have to provide the most information to New York State. Um, and part of that is um, in New York State in order to make things as fair as possible uh, for all of the different uh, wine shops and restaurants to make sure that the prices are the same for everybody. Uh, we have to tell the state um, about a month in advance what our prices are going to be for every single item. Uh, so we tell the state that is published uh, publicly and we can't give a different price to any different restaurant or any different wine shop. If somebody buys one case of uh, wine or one case of sake, we have to uh, use that price for everyone. It can't change at any point. And if we want to change it, we have to tell the state uh, once again a month in advance. And that's different from other states. Um, California is as we like to say, the Wild West. You can, all sorts of things happen in California. You can change the price at any given time. Uh, it can change uh, depending on an account. If somebody wants to buy uh, quite a lot of sake, then you can give them a discount. Um, if they're only buying one or two bottles, uh, you could give them the more higher listed price. Um, but everything is sort of more up for negotiation. Um, so really that's kind of gives you an idea of really the, the variety uh, of what's happening um, in the US in terms of laws. Um, the good news, I think, for uh, a lot of folks, I understand we have a lot of people from Japan tuning in, um, maybe getting a little bit scared or intimidated by all of this. Um, a lot of what companies like mine do, um, if we are an importer, uh, a lot of uh, our job is to make sure that we take care of that. Um, so while I take care of that for uh, sake breweries in Japan, uh, a lot of my colleagues work with wines from France, from Italy, and we take care of all of those different complicated laws and whatnot. So all the, uh, the winemakers from Italy and France have to do is we agree on the price, they send it to us. Once it arrives in the US, we take care of all of the different regulations in different states overall. And that is a lot of what uh, companies like mine, importers and distributors in the US, that is one of our uh, many responsibilities that we have. Uh, to our producers. That's really, really helpful. So, so Jamie, you're a distributor. Andrew's clearly a producer. Mm -hmm. um, Sachiko, tell us about the wild, wild west out in California. Um, what, what, is, um, what is Tipsy? Tell us about Tipsy. What's the story there? Are you a retailer? Are you an importer? Are you a distributor? Kind of talk to us about that wild west out where you are. All right. Tipsy is an e-commerce. So we sell socket online. So we are an online retailer and we can ship to most states. There's a few states that we don't ship to, but um, we mainly handle 720 milliliter size um, as our main product, but then we also carry these 300 milliliter size as a sampler um, in either the three box set or a six box set, which is a subscription. So tipsysake.com is a place that's convenient, especially during COVID times. Um, we're based in California. So all the product right now is being distributed, you know, shipped from our warehouse. Uh, does that make sense? That makes sense. And do you, are there any challenges or Maybe you could talk about shipping over state lines. I know that there are some complexities when you ship over state lines. Maybe if you can just kind of address some of the challenges that exist there. Definitely. So every state almost acts like a different country sometimes um, in culture too, but I, I'm not best with uh, discerning the different um, di dialect. <laughs> I used to live in Boston too, so I can't do a Boston accent. I can't discern it from a New York uh, accent, but I know that if you 
mention the wrong sports team, you might get yourself in a tight spot. That's true. Go um, Sox. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, a, I'm a Mariners fan, so. But <laughs> anyway, um, so yes, depending on the state that we're shipping to, what it means for us is lead time for shipping because Texas, Illinois, and Texas, Illinois, and Oklahoma, they only pick up once a week. So it automatically adds like seven to 10 days to the lead time. So even though shipping time, and, and America's huge. So from California to New York, it's gonna go through several distribution centers and your box is, has seen some days in that travel. So there's a lot of patience that the customer needs sometimes. It's not Amazon. So we're not Amazon. <laughs> and the product that we carry is really precious. So, um, and also not to mention the product that we carry, sake, uses rice that is a seasonal produce, you know, base. So it's like, we're, we're all spoiled by drinking coffee all year round and, you know, going to the grocery store and finding rice all the time. But you have to kind of understand that sake is made very carefully. And to make that certain volume by the breweries that we're carrying sake from, they're calculating and signing contracts like by April on how much rice to buy. So it's, it takes a lot of planning. Um, of course, during COVID time too, uh, there's been some difficult ports and everybody has had difficulty um, with like toilet paper running out and cardboard boxes. So, so yes, um, state regulations, we just can't fight with. So we try to convey as much as we can to the customers, how much the lead time is. It's also a little bit out of our hands what the local carrier is gonna do. So if it's FedEx that's delivering to you or someone else and the driver decides to do something like put it on the front porch when you ask for the back porch or I don't know. It's, it's a little bit out of our hands. So there's, um, there's some challenges there. And in Japan, there's no mail that is lost. Like that's a big deal if, if a piece of mail is lost. But in America, that kind of happens. So it's frightening, but it's still, it still happens at a small percentage. Well, we'll turn to, oh, yeah, go, go for it, Andrew. I wanted to ask a question. Um, yeah, jump in. You, you are considered that uh, retail tier. So you work with distributors to get the product to you? Yes. Yeah, so sometimes we get questions from uh, makers in Japan or um, people that do not have representation for their product in America yet. Like, can you carry our product? We can't. So we need, just like Jamie was saying, because it's separate, we need an importer or distributor that is going to sell it to us. So you need representation first in order for us to carry it. We sell directly to customers. Um, if, you, if you own a restaurant or business that handles alcohol in the US, you're better off ordering directly from the distributor and not through Tipsy because Tipsy is for customers, like a regular customer. That's why we can uh, deliver to homes. Hey, Andrew, I want to turn to you for a second, kind of hear a little bit from the brewer standpoint, and then maybe we'll go back to the distributor and we'll, we'll go to Jamie after this. Um, I just want to hear, you know, as you're, we now have Jamie as kind of the distributor, Sachiko is the retailer, and you're obviously the producer. So we've tried to build this conversation around this tripart um, theme, you know, the, the differentiation in America. Um, tell us a little bit about from the producer standpoint, what it was like to set up a brewery, what are some of the challenges that you faced? And you clearly work with retailers and distributors. So how does that work from your side? Yeah, so it's, it 
it can be daunting at first. And I think that, um, you know, when we were still in planning, we were trying to figure this out. It was, it was, it was a, seemed like a giant mountain. Um, and, you know, like Bernie had said earlier, that was a big reason why I thought uh, an association might be needed here in the U.S. because um, I felt alone. I felt like I was on a desert island <laughs> and, you know, the resources just weren't there. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to form and build some relationships with other uh, U.S.-based brewers and visit their spots and start to piece together what was maybe going to happen. Um, and so, yeah, like Bernie said, we, uh, on a federal level, we are both uh, a beer and wine producer. You have to get both licenses, um, which, you know, sounds like a lot. It's extra money. It's extra time. There's extra paperwork. But it's possible. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, once you kind of cross that threshold, you're, you're usually in a pretty good spot. Um, but then I think the real challenge is when it starts to come down to the state level. And like Sachiko was saying, every state treats it differently. Um, so in Virginia, we are considered a wine. Um, but like Bernie said, other states consider it a beer. Uh, and, and, you know, in Virginia, they have different tiers of, of wine. So whether you're a farm winery or actually a commercial winery, which puts us in a certain category. Uh, and um, in order for us to sell our sake out of our tap room, we had to have a food component, you know, bottom line, you, you have to have it food made fresh, uh, all during the hours that you're serving your sake. So it changed my business model immediately, you know, uh, because it was just critical to, for me uh, as a small producer in, uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, I knew I needed to get the product in the hands of people I needed them to taste it. Um, and so having that experience was, was paramount. Um, and so, yeah, it, it totally shifted how we were going to do business. And while uh, I think that it worked out at the end of the day, that we have a, a, a wonderful restaurant and tasting room here, uh, I don't think it's really great to kind of have to, to kind of make such a drastic shift right off the bat when you have so many other challenges. How are we going to source rice? How are we going to get um, the tanks that we want? How are we going to steam our rice? Like, all of these challenges, like I said, can feel just like huge mountains. Um, but I will say, like I said, at least we have uh, put together this association as it is now, and there are connections and resources available to you. Um, and while it does seem daunting, you're able to get to the other side. And I think that um, kind of our mentality was, let's get open. You know, we'll, let's jump through the hoops we have to jump through to get open. And then down the line, let's try to affect change and see how we can uh, push the laws towards our direction. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a challenge for sure, uh, but one that I think is really worth it. Um, and hopefully we can, we can push it in the right direction. I appreciate that. And I think, you know, what, what I'm hearing is that if you're a brewery and you're thinking about moving into the U.S. market, um, whether it's uh, you know moving from overseas to the U.S. market, or you're a U.S. citizen, or you're just planning to set up a brewery, choosing your state uh, is important, uh, and choosing a state that uh, meets your business objectives as a brewery is important. So, um, you know, there's taxation issues to think about. There's uh, the licensing, but yeah, I think this is a just something to be aware of more than a yeah. more than something to fear. Just something to be aware. I, I would agree of. with that. Yeah, it's it's it is choosing state, and you know, there's a lot. There were a lot of questions for us being the first sake producer in Virginia. Uh, there had never been a decision on this, and so we kind of went to uh, the Virginia ABC board and kind of said, "Hey, this is what we we want to be," uh, and they decided what they decided. Um, and so I think we had a lot of fear at some points because there's, <laughs> there's obviously a lot of confusion about the definition of sake and, uh, and about what it is at its core. And even some of the people that we spoke to would say things like, isn't that a liquor? Shouldn't you be under liquor laws? And that was like, whoa, because <laughs> in Virginia, that's even more oppressive. And so it's one of those things that, um, you know, it's just important to kind of look at the state you're in and really drill down into those laws and understand how best to um, kind of attack that and say, you know, we're grain-based, we do an enzymatic conversion, there's no natural sugars, 
how does that line up with the laws that are already on the books um, and see how that flows out. And at the end of the day, they might make a decision uh, for you or against you or not against you, but in a different way, but you can still hopefully make it work, you know? So Jamie and uh, Sachiko is on the distribution and the retail side. You know, this, this whole conversation is about the rules of the brew. You know, are there specific laws or regulations that you face on a day-to-day -day basis that you think uh, really affect the sake industry that, that, you, uh, that you see? Jamie, I think you're on mute. There you I'm go. Sorry about that. Um, if I may, actually, I wanted to just kind of um, maybe clarify a little bit, I think both for uh, sake producers uh, in the U.S. and also uh, sake makers uh, in Japan, kind of um, a little bit more of how the, the system works overall and really what your options are as a, you know, as a, a sake brewery, like what your options are for distribution uh, throughout the US, how that works, uh, et cetera. Um, so I think um, first off the, the idea, uh, Sachko said earlier that uh, every state is like a different country. Well, technically every state kind of is a different country actually. So you, um, I, I didn't realize this uh, until last year, actually. But you as a brewery um, can give permission to have your sake sold really in any, any number of states that you want. So if you're a sake brewery coming from Japan uh, and there is an importer, uh, for example, Skernik Wines in this case, uh, we, are, we distribute directly in about eight states. Um, and many of the sake that I work with right now, uh, we have permission to import and sell the sake in those eight states. Um, specifically, the people we worked with in Japan were very concerned with quality and they wanted to make sure, um, you know, as Sachko was saying, there's, when you move from state to state, there can be lags with time. You're not, sh you're not sure how product is going to be treated. Um, our partners in Japan uh, right now felt most comfortable to only work, uh, to only have their sake sold in the states that we are direct in. So that means there's only one company when they sell to us, there's only one company uh, between, uh, between the sake brewery and the, the wine shop or the restaurant. That's us. Uh, so in some cases, you could have an importer. Uh, that importer sells to the distributor that sells locally. So, you know, that's another step. That's another uh, game of telephone where it's different people talking to one another, uh, information gets lost. Uh, when it's the same company uh, with the same state, uh, that's just one step. So product is being moved around a little bit less. Um, and in that case, you know, we don't have permission to sell uh, those items to other states, to other distributors. Just because we are bringing it into the U.S. doesn't mean once it gets into the U.S. we can do whatever we want with it. Um, it's, that's the permission we have uh, from our uh, breweries in Japan. And that's the same thing with, you know, breweries in America. You can choose in different states who you want to sell to, who you trust. Um, you could choose two companies. Um, and that's, I've seen some people do that. We don't think that's a very smart idea to have the same product offered by two companies. You know, sometimes the companies will compete on price. People get confused um, as to where to buy it, things like that. Uh, so it's really a, a more of a, a personal business choice, I think, by the brewery of um, who do you want to work with? Who do you feel is the best uh, representative of your product. Um, and if you're selling to a company that's just an importer, not a distributor, do you think that they're the, the best for that? And there's many great uh, sake specific importers that then choose distributors carefully and, and work that out. Um, in our case, uh, we're able to do both those things. But if we were to sell it in say, Virginia, uh, a state where we do not sell directly, we would be giving that to another company. Um, and that's another um, you know, another layer of, of the product moving around, uh, a, another layer of people you have to uh, explain what it is, how it's made, where it comes from, things like that. Um, so that's something I think for both uh, producers in uh, the US and Japan uh, to think about. Um, that being said, once you find, I think, a good partner, and, and there are a, a lot of great uh, distributors that care a lot about uh, proper um, storage, making sure it's at the right temperature, uh, that care about um, you know, explaining it correctly, particularly smaller companies are able to do that. Uh, they're really passionate about who they work with. Um, so I, I think you know, that's, there's a lot of different options out there. Um, we're, you know, we're one, but we're only in a couple states. Um, so that's, a, I think, one thing I wanted to clarify, uh, hopefully. That's really, really helpful. Um, I, I wanna kind of pivot our conversation slightly 
Um, Sachiko, you made a really interesting comment in, in the chat uh, box uh, just a little while ago. You mentioned that uh, you're about to add 120 new products in the next few months. Is the industry growing? I mean, this is, I want to understand from your perspective as a retailer, uh, Jamie, from your perspective as a distributor and Andrew as a producer, where's the industry growing? Is it even growing? Uh, what are you seeing in your own uh, in your own industry or your own uh, businesses? So I'm not an analyst, but uh, from my point of view, it's definitely growing. And it is just, the, we're just at the tip of the iceberg. Um, Tipsy did a, our marketing associate did a uh, survey end of last year. And majority of our customers had never, had never purchased alcohol from anywhere else. So we're tapping into new audience here and maybe, co I'm sure part of it is COVID. Everybody has more time to browse online, but it's, it's such an enticing product that if you come by it, there's, you just kind of can't ignore it. And what Tipsy is good at, I think, um, is hitting, targeting new people. So I did want to mention that um, we're new <laughs> and we're a startup. We're growing very rapidly. When we put products on sale, it sells like crazy. <laughs> so last week we had a NAMA. Um, we don't typically sell on pasteurized sake or nama sake, um, unless we taste it and kind of test it and make sure that the, there's no quality uh, concern for shipping. Because like I said, America is so large that it could take a few weeks sometimes. Um, it probably takes like five business days or so for, for things to ship from our warehouse to New York, let's say East Coast. Um, and that is why when Jamie was talking about importers and distributors that, that take care of their product, that's refrigerated, they, we know that from the maker to the port and then to the port and then, and it's stored at their temperature control, you know, place, we want to keep it there as long as we can. So at Tipsy, we basically order when the customer orders. So we get that shipment the next day it's packaged, then it goes out the door. So it stays conditioned the longest that it can. And I think I got sidetracked here, but <laughs> um, what were we talking about? We're talking about the growth of the industry. I mean, yes, you're adding 120 products. Yeah, so we don't usually carry Nama, but there was this beautiful product from Denshin Huyu that we couldn't resist and we ordered 10 cases, it was gone within a day. So we, we realized there's NAMA buyers in our, you know, in our customer base. And this is one of the first times that we carried NAMA. Hmm. So now we're like, all right, so next year we're gonna have to order five times as much because we don't wanna disappoint customers by you know, advertising for it. Um, it's definitely growing and like I said, I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg. We have 300 products right now um, registered at Tipsy. We're adding 120 more. The crazy thing about all these premium products that we get in America, we get so much amazing stuff. And every importer distributor has their weaknesses and strengths. And unless you tell the story, behind each bottle, it's, it's very difficult to choose, you know, that one bottle out of what we're gonna have 450 mm -hmm. products to choose from. So it's gotta look good for us, honestly. We try to make, you know, like our sample boxes, like look good, jake guy. <laughs> we look at the cover. Um, and also it's, like looking into the story and looking into, we try our best um, because we're lucky to be bilingual at our company. We do, we try our best 
to get the story from the maker so that we know we're able to say, you know, with what intent this bottle was made. You know, this bottle was made with this intent because it just, it changes, it changes your experience and it changes your, it changes the value completely when yeah. you know that tidbit, you know, like. Jamie, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's it. I was going to say, Jamie and Andrew, what, you know, what is your take on the industry growth? I mean, Sachiko brought up a great point about storytelling, uh, and that's huge. Uh, where, what are you finding in your neck of the woods? Um, yeah, so my, um, I mean, that brings me to really how I got involved in sake is I had been uh, involved in Japanese cuisine for a while, first in Japan, and then um, coming back to New York, uh, was, you know, very excited to work with uh, some really great Japanese restaurants here. And that, that kind of led into sake, mostly because um, was had, hadn't experienced much sake in Japan. I mean, I drank it, but didn't really get very deeply into it. Um, but at Japanese restaurants, um, particularly in America, uh, you're almost inevitably drinking sake. Um, I've had friends who have opened restaurants uh, with ver uh, Japanese restaurants with very ambitious wine lists. I mean, they had amazing wine selections. I mean, it would be an amazing um, wine selection at any restaurant, Japanese or not. And they would also have sake and they'd say, well, we're mostly, we're wine people. We're mostly going to push the wine. Doesn't matter. People go to a Japanese restaurant, they will order sake. Um, and this is part of just sort of the overall boom and in interest in Japanese food. I mean, I know that Japanese media uh, talks about this quite a bit, but it's, it's really surprising. Um, you know, when I moved back to the U.S. 10, 12 years ago, words like dashi, umami, um, these were not regular words. And now I think anyone who's paying a little bit of attention to food is 100% familiar with dashi, umami, um, what is an izakaya. Uh, and these were fairly niche, small things, you know, 13, 10, you know, 10, 13 years ago. Uh, and the same thing with sake. Uh, people always wanted, now that people are going to eat more Japanese food and they're uh, very interested in Japanese food, um, automatically people want to have sake with that. Um, and one thing that really surprised me when I started at my current job, because again, I worked all in Japanese restaurants um, here in New York. Uh, I had you know, friends that worked at many different types of restaurants. Uh, but when I joined my company, uh, I was thinking, well, well, we'll mostly sell the Japanese restaurants and, and we'll try to see if we can sell to a little bit of uh, people doing other types of cuisine. Almost naturally, um, I had people from all kinds of different restaurants coming to us asking for sake. And the main reason for that um, was interesting, was just the explosion in interest in Japanese cuisine and ingredients. Uh, so, for example, um, I mean, I'm not going to say into the name of the restaurant because they like to keep this secret. Possibly the, the most, one of the most well-respected uh, French high-end restaurants here in New York. Um, they don't list it on their menu. They use soy sauce, dashi, miso as kakushiaji, as sort of the, the, the background flavors, things that can boost up the flavor of a dish. But if you were eating there, you would think it was the most kind of um, classic American French cuisine. Um, so many people are doing that now. Many um, restaurants that are sort of younger, more dynamic, creative restaurants are using these Japanese ingredients. And then the people managing the restaurants that are managing the beverage naturally think, well, we should have Japanese beverages to, to go with this. My, my chef is always talking about Japanese ingredients. He's always talking about um, Japanese techniques. You know, oh, this is a a play on, you know, it was um, times I've had, oh, these are potato croquettes and it's much more, or, um, oh, these are cabbage pancakes. And it was actually plays on okonomiyaki, things like that. Uh, so they're naturally asking for sake. And I didn't have to sell to them as much as people were asking me, we know we should have sake. We don't know what we, you know, what we should carry. Um, so that is a small but growing movement. Um, and then overall, just, uh, I think, respect for and interest in Japanese uh cuisine in general. Um, when I moved to Japan in 2002, everybody thought Japanese food was sushi. That's it. You know, maybe noodles or something. Um, the past couple years, I meet young chefs who've trained in sort of French classic programs. You ask them what their favorite cuisine is, and everybody says, I want to go to Japan. I want to learn what they're doing there. Everybody, it's, it, it's a general, anybody who's paying attention to food is obsessed with Japan in a way that I didn't see, you know, even five, 10 years ago. Um, and that's naturally bringing interest to sake. 
Um, my final thing I'll say about that, and the biggest anecdote was when I first started working in Japanese restaurants 13 years ago, you would serve someone a sake um, and they would be, oh, wow, I didn't know sake could be good um, because so many people here had had cheap, not very good sake. Um, and then that slowly changed to people saying, well, I know sake can be good, but I don't know what to get. Um, and then recently people saying, hey, I know there's a huge diversity of sake. Um, they've seen, there's movies been made about it now. There's more media out there you can see. And people know that there is this big world out there. Um, and I think a lot of that is, you know, people like Andrew and all of these small uh, breweries that we're seeing popping up, people that are aware that there is this whole world out there and wanting to explore it, but just not knowing what it is. Um, so that's organically creating this, just this kind of very good, uh, very good interest in it. Um, and I know from a Japanese perspective, Japan is terrified of booms. There's so many, you know, fads where things get very popular for two to three years and then the interest drops off. And I know that a lot of people are really afraid um, of getting burned with that. That if you have a really popular product and suddenly you make a lot and then two years later, the interest dries up. America generally isn't like that. It's sort of a, you know, I, I think the trends are much more gradually building um, and sort of, uh, it's not going to be these big stiff or big sharp, um, you know, uh, up and down uh, things with demand. It's much more kind of, it's been like this pretty consistently the past years. And it may go a little bit like this, but it's not going to drop off. Um, I, I would be very surprised if suddenly the interest just goes away for Zake. Yeah, that's what we've seen in the in the association. But Andrew, let me give you an opportunity to kind of weigh in on the growth. But also, if you could just sort of touch on, you know, are you able to sell direct uh, and maybe kind of what you're seeing as you sell direct to consumers and maybe provide some advice to Japanese breweries who are looking at America and thinking about the growth of the industry? Yeah, a lot, lot to unpack there. But um, I look at two big factors in, in how I see sake growing. One is my own production and tasting room. Obviously, I, I'm lucky enough to have a pulse on what I'm seeing coming in the door, conversations I have with customers as they're coming in, what they like, um, their reaction to seeing a, a sake brewery for the first time. Um, and all of that is pointing in a positive direction. I can't tell you how many people come in here and have and leave with a whole new appreciation for, for sake. Um, the second thing that I look at is honestly the number of uh, sake breweries that are opening here in the US uh, and in North America, uh, and also the people who are coming to visit me. Um, I've had quite a number of people uh, take the trek down and uh, spend a day or two with me back here and, and um, you know, learning and asking questions. And, um, and I think to Jamie's point, it's not a, a short-term play. Building a sake brewery is not a short-term play. <laughs> this is, we're in it for the long haul. And so uh, I'm a big believer in a rising tide raises all ships. Um, I want more sake breweries to open in the U.S. I want more Japanese producers to uh, bring their product over here because I think the more people drink it, the more they fall in love with it. And if they try a sake, you know, at, in Asheville at Ben's or in, uh, you know, Texas or Colorado or Col uh, California or incredible ones from Japan, they're going to come to my place. Uh, we're all going to sell more sake and everyone's going to be better for it. So that's kind of the metric I look at is, um, is just the, the people, the producers who are interested in getting into this business. I think that's an incredible, incredible metric. Um, so I don't know if that's advice for Japanese brewer more than just like, I'd love to see your products and drink your products. And I think that um, there's room, you know, USA is, and North America is huge. Um, and there's a lot of space for us to all kind of, to grow into it. Um, you know, and Bernie, you've got a better probably number than I do, but you know, we're in the 2023 20, brewery range right now. I mean, that's, that's nothing compared to, to beer breweries or wineries or even sake breweries in Japan. Um, so I think we have a lot to learn from each other and I hope that, um, you know, we can, we can build relationships that can help foster that growth. And so we're here for it. Um, can I just say, Andrew, that for me, my first brewery, sake brewery experience was at Todd Bellamy's place back when it was Dovetail Sake. And he 
we happened to ring the doorbell when he was doing his press, his test batch. And I had a cup of like super, super freshly pressed sake. And it was, to me, that's one of the moments that like changed my life. You know, I used to work in architecture in Boston and I was like, I'm changing my job. <laughs> <laughs> and my first, my first sake brewery experience was in America. It was in Massachusetts and it inspired me so much. And like we're saying, this is a super like rapidly growing market, but I totally agree with you. There's room for everybody. It's not a place to be protective of your sake against someone else's sake. We all can benefit from it. And Tipsy is a new new player. There's been retailers that are, you know that have been do, doing amazing jobs building this community, like True Sake and Sakaya in New York and Sakenomi in Seattle and sake shop and you know like they've been working at it for 15 years and we're just new shipping it to people out in the boonies that can't go to a, a Japanese grocery store to buy their sake so I have you know and I used to work at a sake brewery in Seattle so I have so and everybody that I meet is so much more Japanese inside than I am and they're way more humble and like it's like everybody is more Japanese inside and I'm the banana, you know, white inside and yellow on the outside who gets to talk about it. But I am totally with you. We're all in this together. There's so much room for growth. We can only benefit from each other. And, and I think, thank you. Yeah. Thank you to yeah. everybody. And I would just also kind of add that, you know, the future is, is bright. Um, but we're also at a young moment where we have an opportunity to um, help shape and direct it and to have input. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, I'm gonna keep, keep pitching the Sake Brewers Association because I think it's critical. It's critical for us to come together and have conversations like this about what we are going to do to make it better for everyone. How do we grow this industry? And we do it together. We do it by identifying problems like some of these uh, ones that we could potentially influence down the line. You know, I don't know when we'll be able to actually do some of that stuff, but hopefully sooner than later. Um, but it starts with community and it starts with uh, kind of putting that information out on the table and saying, hey, what, what can we do? Um, how do we build consensus? How do we, how do we move that mark forward for the benefit of sake? Um. I think we, this conversation is fantastic. We could go on and on and on. I, I, I kind of feel like we needed a three hour conversation about this. Um, a few of the highlights that sort of jump out at me are um, that the laws in America and, and beyond in Canada and Mexico can be confusing, but there are resources at your fingertips. Uh, people like Sachiko and Jamie and Andrew and the entire brewing community um, what we at the Sake Brewers Association refer to as the allied trade. Um, it's very much a, uh, a circle of friendship, really. Uh, almost everybody in the sake industry here in North America is extraordinarily open to the industry growing and um, it, very friendly. So if you're, if you're out there listening and you're thinking, I want to set up a sake brewery, I want to bring my brewery to America, I want to sell my product here, whatever it is, uh, please know that you have a home here and that uh, there's an entire community waiting to help you. Um, I know that the hour is pretty much over at this point, um, but before I hand it back to Wes, uh, just give you each one more second to just kind of uh, close us out here. Any sort of final thoughts that you might have uh, as we're moving on? Um, yeah, just to, I, I think just to uh, build on what you were saying there, Bernie, um, what really drew me into uh, sake here in the U.S. is um, come to New York and New York uh, City has a very vibrant, um, really even growing uh, sake scene. I mean, that was the case in 2007. Uh, and many people uh, that were sort of the pioneers of sake here in New York, people like uh, Chizuko uh, Nikawa, um, uh, Chris Johnson, uh, Tim Sullivan, those are people uh, sort of who really, when there wasn't, you know, much resources in terms of sake, they were people who did the research, made the connections, um, were good about promoting brands uh, here in New York specifically and then around the U.S. And they really 
they started creating uh, this community that now, I mean, I, I, th I think of myself as the second generation of that. And now there's a third generation of people who've come in even later than I have who are so excited to sell sake, promote it. That's people at the restaurant level. Um, people now more and more in wine shops are really, really well informed. Um, and then also uh, people who are connecting sake brands and uh, just sake breweries to regular American consumers. Um, and I like to think, I mean, I, I, I like to think that New York has one of the strongest kind of uh, communities of that, but more and more I'm seeing that branch out to all over the US. Um, and really that's been kind of amazing. That's what brought me into this specifically it was such great people, uh, so enthusiastic, so passionate about it. Um, and that I think Japan a lot of times looks at the US and they're not quite sure like, oh, I don't know, it's don't quite know who to talk to and whatnot, but really the, a lot of the Korsaki community were excited about the category as a whole. And we all support one another hundred um, percent. People that have my job at different companies, we refer uh, you know, business to one another. If somebody asks a question about a sake that we don't sell, we're very happy to share it. Um, for us, in my opinion, and, and overall, we're just happy to sort of um, make, you know, I obviously want to support all of the brands that I sell, but I'm very happy. And I think the way forward is to make it all, uh, all better overall and not to get involved in, you know, <laughs> trying to cut each other down. Uh, I'll just say that I think that uh, a section of growth here in the U.S. is, is going to be from producers. I think that um, us producers need to come together and we need to work on some of this stuff, but uh, that includes Japanese producers. So producers unite. Sachiko, any final words for, for the listeners? Yes. Um, what Bernie was saying in the beginning, building this atmosphere for positive growth Sake is like the best beverage to do that. It's so inclusive. It is made for sharing. I mean, I drink solo enough, but I'm thinking about others. So <laughs> I think that counts, but um, it has been incredible. Um, so I thank you for having me as part of this opportunity. And, and thank you to everyone, Jamie and Andrew and everyone for supporting this because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for everybody that built it up before I just came and drank and talked about stuff. So. Well, before we, uh, before we hand it back to Wes, um, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't actually have a little bit of a compie here. So uh, thank you. And Wes, join us, join us in the compie. <laughs> um, so thank you for, um, for the fantastic discussion. Thank you for what you do for the industry. The Sake Brewers Association is here to support all of you. And uh, kanpai. 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 And thank you for the amazing interpreters. Mm. Wes, it's back to you. Uh, I'll right. let you close us out here. Sure thing. Thanks, Bernie. Thank you all. That was a really great conversation. Um, learned a lot. And, you know, I think that Obviously, the industry faces a lot of hurdles in the regulatory um, front, but it's so great to hear you all end on such a positive note. I think the sock industry has nowhere to go but up, and, and you know, you all know you have your fingers on the pulse of this industry, and so it's really great to hear that from you all. So I want to thank you. Um, just before we sign off, I want to um, remind everybody um, that all our viewers that we have our third and final webinar coming up that will be Tuesday, March 23rd. Um, that will be a short and we'll debut our short animated um, film on the joy of sake and sake making. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, that will be followed by a panel discussion with three of our member brewers. Uh, who will describe their own stories about getting into the sake uh, field. So we're really excited about that. That will be also done in conjunction with the National Cherry Blossom Festival, which is the nation's largest celebration of the friendship between Japan and the United States. It's such a great event, and we're really excited to be part of that. Um, Fine. Uh, and you can just to, to, to get information on that, uh, please visit our website at www.sakeassociation.org. You can register there as well. Um, finally, we, as I said, have a survey at the end of this session. We really appreciate your feedback on how you thought of tonight's event. So please just take a minute to fill that out. And finally, I just want to thank, uh, again, our partners in this project, the um, Japanese Embassy, 
uh, Japan House Los Angeles, Japan America Society of Washington, Washington DC for all of your support. Um, it's really great to work uh, together institutionally with you all. Uh, so with that, I want to thank all our viewers. It's great. I, I saw that we have a global viewership tonight. It's really amazing. So uh, such a wonderful gathering of people that are really enthusiastic about sake. Thank you all. Good night. And one last kampai. 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 <laughs>